Okay, go. Hi everyone, today's session is going to be on gene therapy and uh, this is quite an interesting therapy, uh, uh, a therapy as well as a topic to do on the medical debate actually because it's a very new area of research um, so I thought it might be interesting to do this on. Okay, so the first thing is what exactly is gene therapy? Now actually before I reveal that, how many people have actually heard of gene therapy before we start? Just put it in the chat or raise your hand or whatever. Maybe put um, anything you know about it as well. Any small details, put them in the chat. So I've got two yeses. Anyone else? Don't really. That's fine. I didn't. I didn't know, but a lot about it before I researched it either. It you. It is used to alter the genome of an organism. Yeah. Okay. So um, yeah. So that's that's a very uh, a, a very umbrella sort of uh, overview of the topic, but we're going to go into it. So yeah, it's fine if you don't know a lot about it. Um, before I formally learned about it, it was something that was completely new to me as well. So I'm going to explain my research with you guys. Okay, so what exactly is it? In gene therapy, genes are introduced into the nucleus of cells by the means of a vector. And this is usually a virus. This is done because the chemical processes in our brain uh, mean that the genes in our cells and the genes in our entire body constantly mutate in our bodies and as we get older more mutations occur every uh, every single day even now in your bodies mutations are occurring some of these are good mutations and some of them are bad the only thing is that because humans don't really have a huge amount of selection pressures our mutations don't really stay like there's no way to easily see which one is adv advantageous and which one is not mutations increase in frequency as we age as i said and there are actually two types of gene therapy uh, one of them is called in vivo and one of them is called ex vivo. Okay, so we're going to talk about in vivo gene therapy first of all. So in vivo gene therapy is, this is the type of gene therapy where the attenuated virus is injected with the new gene and this is injected straight into the body. Does anyone know what I mean by attenuated? Maybe put it in the chat. if you don't mind reading some out, I can't really see it. Oh, okay, yeah, someone said attached. Um, someone else has said not harmful. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's the second one, the not harmful one. Attenuated means that the uh, pathogenic qualities of the virus have been taken away so that the only part of the virus left is the part that can actually introduce a capsid inside of a cell, but the capsid does not uh, contain its uh, reverse transcriptase or any of the enzymes or the RNA inside a virus which could actually cause harmful effects. So the virus is attenuated to remove its pathogenic qualities as viruses replicate inside cells using the cell's organelles, the translation mechanisms and the nucleus. And so it'd be very dangerous if we were directly injecting the virus into the cells of someone by hand. These genes, which we input, may be used to decrease or increase the production of a certain protein, uh, to translate a new protein, or to cause a frame shift. Now, I'm sure everyone's very familiar with A-level biology, where you know mutations uh, can be either insertion, deletion, or um, uh, 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 a substitution. And I don't think we really need to go into that. If you're not sure about what I just said, please tell us, and we will be more than happy to go over that really, really quickly. Okay, I'm gonna take that as everyone knows what I'm talking about then. Um, in vivo gene therapy does not require mitotic cells. And by that, I mean, uh, the thing that we're gonna talk about next, which is ex vivo will require mitotic cells or cells that can undergo mitosis. In vivo does not require this because this is within your body. And so any cells in your body will at one point undergo mitosis, but can lead to a greater immunological response because the cells are inside the body. So the next thing we're going to talk about is ex vivo gene therapy. And before we actually, um, you know, explain it on the slide, does anyone, um, you know, want to quickly have a go at, at summarizing it themselves about anything you know about it? Or in fact, using what we've just learned about in vivo gene therapy, can you kind of guess what ex vivo, um, you know, might involve in some of the aspects of it? 
So someone said outside of the body, um, like in a test tube, and then cells are um, are reintroduced, requires mitotic cells. Yeah, so that's the general idea. Yeah, sit down if you uh, move on the slide. So um, yeah, ex vivo gene therapy, it's essentially the opposite of in vivo. It's where you would remove the cells first um, from the body, um, and then the attenuated virus is injected into the new gene, and this is then injected um, into the removed cells. Um, and then, of course, these cells will be returned to the body again afterwards. Um, and actually, um, there are a few occasions where um, an attenuated virus isn't actually required since the cells are um, have been removed from the body, um, and therefore the kind of um, the harmful pathogenic effect of the virus um, won't be immediately felt. And once once the, those cells are um, able to, they can be returned back into the body again. Um, and of course, the advantage of this is that um, they can, you know, select the cells um, that they need. They can um, ensure that everything can go right without causing a harmful effect to the body. Um, and they can also be chosen to enhance therapeutic potential. And this obviously is a bit controversial, which we'll talk about a bit later. Um, but it does require us to remove mitotic cells, which is a potential um, disadvantage um, as well. Someone's just asked, could you give an example of where a gene therapy might be used? Well, I'm I'm happy you asked that actually. Um, I put into the chat now a link um, to an article which I was reading earlier about ex vivo gene therapy. Um, and it talks about how it can be used to treat a range of neurological conditions, which include um, Alzheimer's disease um, and you know various other ones. So I would really recommend reading that. It does get a little bit technical. It's sometimes a bit hard to understand, but it does, it's also very detailed and it goes into, it talks about mutations and um, you know, whether, um, you know the, how mutations can affect the, our ability to use these gene therapies to treat um, certain diseases. But yeah, you know, an example would be Alzheimer's or in similar neurological conditions um, when we'll, cells can be removed. Yes, yeah, sorry. We will also in this uh, presentation go over some of the potential uses of gene therapy uh, in a later slide. Mm -hmm, yeah, yeah. So that's that's more or less a summary of um, ex vivo gene therapy. Um, so yeah, I think we can move on. Yeah. So um, this is, like I said, we're just going to talk about the gene, th the advantages and problems of potential advantages and problems of gene therapy. So it could potentially be used to treat Huntington's, hemophilia, cystic fibrosis, muscular dystrophy and Alzheimer's. Now, I don't know if anyone recognizes this or not, but especially with Huntington's and cystic, cystic fibrosis, a lot of these are um, diseases which are governed by uh, one allele and and the presence of one allele so you know as, as we've discussed in a previous session on the medical debate you know uh, heterozygous and um, homozygous and dominant and recessive alleles and it's very important uh, to realize that because we're changing that gene because we could produce a new protein or alter the allele that could lead to this disease not being there and that's why it's used to treat these diseases um, it's a very experimental and a very dangerous gene therapy as a whole. It's not actually legal yet, and it's not actually working yet. Um, it could potentially have great potential for uh, future medical treatments, but it's also very likely to be very, very expensive because you would have to attenuate a virus, but then also find the correct gene to implement into someone's body. This could lead to a decrease in the justice pillar of medical ethics, because obviously, you know, justice says you should be treating everyone fairly and legally, but if not everyone is able to have access to the treatment, then that's no longer upholding that pillar. Not only this, but it could be against autonomy, if, especially with trials or when it's first coming out, the government is regulating who can try gene therapy or, or a, uh, a firm is regulating who can try their gene therapy. Yeah, and I think just to add on to that quickly, um, you, you mentioned the fact that um, certain, you know, certain characteristics, certain disorders, are governed by multiple genes um, or by multiple alleles. And um, that's why gene therapy is particularly difficult to use when in polygenic disorders, where you have um, a disorder which is caused by mutations in multiple genes. Um, and that's why it can be ex extremely dangerous because if there are certain changes to a, one gene, but then something goes wrong in the other one, or if, if it doesn't have a full effect, then that can cause you know certain proteins to be produced other proteins not to be produced and that can you know have a very um very you know potentially very disastrous effect and that's why it is very um controversial still especially with neurological conditions um and there have been cases where attempts at gene therapy have led to more more damage than kind of um good and that's why there are some ethical issues there someone's actually mentioned in the chat um another problem um is 
um, that religious people may disagree. Um, yeah, that's very true. And we'll talk a bit more about the ethical you know, issues surrounding this a bit later. But um, yes, definitely. And also with embryos as well, because a lot of gene therapy testing is done on embryos um, and embryonic cells. Um, and that is that is why um, you know many people have these religious observations. They don't believe it's right to test on embryos, um, and that's why you know that, that those can be some of the issues there. And also, not just embryos, just stuff to do with removing cells from the body, editing them. You know, some people have the idea that we shouldn't you know go down that pathway of kind of editing people, especially just for you know kind of um, therapeutic benefits for kind of. Um, you know, to enhance certain characteristics as well. Um, so yeah, definitely. Yeah, so this is actually a case study. I think Shivas, you're gonna do this one, right? Yeah, yeah, so this is a case study about Dr. Martin Klein. Um, and yeah, he's, he was one of the pioneers of this um, of gene therapy. Um, in 1980, he became the first person to conduct gene therapy experiments on humans. Um, and, you know, this is just some of the detail about the specific um, kind of the science behind it. It was about um, beta thalassemia, I think is how you say it, an autosomal recessive hematological disease caused by a mutation on chromosome 11. Um, and this would lead to decreased production of this protein, beta globin um, chains, which would lead to um, various conditions, which would then cause um, anemia, which I'm sure some of you will have heard of. Um, and so this, this, you know, treatment that he pioneered um, was thought to be a very big achievement, um, even though it was unsuccessful, um, because um, it was seen as, you know, a step forward into this new kind of era of being able to edit genes. But it did also attract a lot of criticism um, with allegations um, to perform human um, gene therapy trials, um, and people thought this circumvented the the regulations in the United States about human clinical trials. And even now there are a lot of, you know, governments which ban this kind of thing, which ban research into um, gene therapy, or there are very heavy restrictions. Um, and this is because of the potential, um, you know, ethical issues that could stem from it, which we're going to discuss in um, just a minute. And yeah, we've got all the, you know, sources and, and stuff here. So if you want to read more about um, Dr. Klein um, and, and some of his research, then please do um, have a look at that. Yeah, so this is some of the ethical concerns, and I'd like to go over them once before. We got these actually, so normally with ethical concerns, we have to think about this, but it's such a controversial treatment that I literally just did one Google search for ethical concerns, and uh, there were so many. So these are so, some of these are from uh, Medline Plus, as you can see, we've given the source. Uh, so so first of all, how can good and bad uses of gene therapy be distinguished? Because if you think about adding a gene that could actually, like we talked about in epigenetics, you could actually end up changing uh, quite huge amounts of a person um, just artificially. So what does everyone think about this? You know, ethically, how would they distinguish between good and bad uses of gene therapy? Not only this, but why would this present so much, a pro so much of a problem and which pillars does this affect? Does anyone have any ideas? Good and bad uses of gene therapy be distinguished. Well, I think, you know, so, something to think about is the idea of what you know, good and bad actually means. That's the problem here, because it's kind of subjective what good and bad is, what can be considered to be good and what can be considered to be bad. Um, that's where the problem stems from, really, I think. Um, and, you know, with certain treatments, some people might say that um, treating certain diseases is a good thing, but the inequality it would cause, the um, damage to justice and, and that kind of thing, um, could mean that certain people consider these treatments to not really be of much help when trying to tackle these problems as a whole. Um, yeah, we've got some more comments in, in the chat. Simple changes with very clear and empirically proven evidence to support the treatment of a certain condition. Bad could be experimental, non-consensual, cosmetic or non-therapeutic. There is a risk of a process going very wrong. Okay, so both of those are very, very true. Um, and actually, I think uh, 
the idea that non-consensual comes in is, is very important, especially, you know, if, if we're experimenting on people to try and increase the, uh, you know, to try and increase certain factors of a human being, whatever they may be, against their will, that can be very, very, very dangerous. And of course, that's against the autonomy pillar, pillar of medical ethics. Um, and the risk of the process going very wrong is, you know, that's also very, very risky because, um, you know, normally with medicine and science, any study conducted on people should be a prospective study. So they're sort of, that's when they're sort of doing the harm to themselves uh, because they've already been doing it. For example, smoking is a very good example. So rather than getting people to start smoking to see the effects of smoking on people, you look at 10 people who've already been smoking and you follow them. So you're not doing anything bad to them. You're just following people who are making that decision for themselves. Um, that's the same here. You know, you, if you can't be, a, let's say people were given gene therapy, you could only see if it had any effects after making, you know, if those people believed that they were doing, they were getting this injection for the best, uh, inte from the best intentions. And the doctor who was providing it was also giving it from the best of his intent, his or her intentions. The high cost of gene therapy could mean going against the pillars of justice. Uh, that's true, exactly. So think about that. So like we said before, because some people won't be able to afford it, um, that means that some people who may have the same diseases who could potentially be cured will not be afforded the chance to be cured because they, can't, uh, they don't have the financial means to buy such an experimental and expensive treatment. Um, only rich people survive arguably leaving the people with low income to die. Exactly, yeah. I think that's a bit more extreme. I feel like at one point, um, you know, we don't, we don't know what's going to happen in that situation because it's hypothetical. But I think you're right. You know, people who are more financially well off have more of a uh, inclination to be able to afford those things. Okay, next question. Who decides which traits are normal and which constitute a disability or disorder? Basically, in, in context, that means that who would decide if a certain disability requires gene therapy uh, when it possibly isn't a disability? And who would decide, let's say, if someone did have a disability, but that person didn't deem it a disability and they were refused gene therapy, even though it could be potentially uh, very useful? I think, yeah, um, yeah this, this point specifically links very much to what we were talking about last week um, when we did the presentation on disabilities. Um, and we discussed some conditions like deafness, which are which some people would consider to be a disability and which others perhaps wouldn't. And so if if perhaps, you know, deafness was caused by a certain mutation in a gene, let's say, um, and, you know, we were able to treat this using gene therapy, um, could that potentially lead to ethical issues? Because some people might think that we shouldn't be trying to correct deafness. Instead, we should be just trying to make um, our world, our society more accessible for deaf people. For example, by teaching more people British Sign Language, um, for example. Um, so yeah, that's just that's, that's something to think about there. But does anyone have any other perhaps comments to add to this point? Or any examples perhaps that you've, that you've read about? Someone's put in the chat, um, there may be disagreement amongst doctors about who is eligible for gene therapy. Also, as disabled people are more vulnerable, then maybe gene therapy could have negative side effects. Oh, that's a good point, actually. I hadn't uh, completely thought about that, that actually if someone is chosen for gene therapy um, in the best of intentions, even then there's no guarantee that people who have bad immune system or systems already or have underlying health conditions in addition to the genetic disorders that um, gene therapy would be used to treat would still possibly be at a um, at a disadvantage because of their immune system and that they might not survive gene therapy um, that's actually a really good point yeah they don't have people sorry that they don't have on people who don't have disabilities yeah exactly yeah because uh, the underlying health effects of uh, someone who has a already weak immune system is actually very important to consider because you are changing. Changing a gene is very, very, it's, it's changing a fundamental part of you because, you know, genes obviously translate for proteins, proteins translate, uh, trans proteins translate into basically the entire structure of your body. Um, yeah, Shivas, do you have anything to say about that point? No, I think, but I think it's a good comment that the person, the, this person's made in the chat, um, you know, about who is eligible for gene therapy. 
And of course, that could perhaps lead to more inequality with people, um, you know, being able to um, get to gene therapy and then perhaps be in some ways superior to other people. I mean, this does kind of lead down the eugenics line as well, which we again talked about last week and the dangers regarding that. Um, so yes, it, it you know there are definitely some disadvantages there, um, and also yes, yeah, you said um, disabled people are more vulnerable. Um, that's very true, and also um, it could lead to a divide because some people, um, you know, of the reasons that people are, are getting gene therapy. If gene therapy becomes very accessible, um, there could be some people who who want to use it to be able to treat disorders, and other people who want it for a more about, you know, just to enhance certain features or to, you know, become, um, you know, better in some way. And so there would, there would be a divide there and perhaps it would, it would, doctors would have to decide whether or not um, patients are, um, should be allowed to have gene therapy um, based on, on its need. Um, and that's kind of similar in, with the situation we have today with plastic surgery. And there is still a debate um, regarding whether cosmetic surgery should be allowed considering the fact that it's not really seen as a, as a need um, when it's done just for cosmetic purposes, um, and perhaps instead medical resources should be going towards other aspects, you know, more more emergency situations or more um, important situations. So yeah, um, I think the the point after this about will the high cost of gene therapy make it available to only the wealthy? We've already kind of discussed that. Um, so, but yes, you know, again, we we talked about how that could potentially lead to inequality yeah. um yeah someone said in the chat could people get gene therapy at any age um and that's that's an interesting comment as well that you know perhaps that would have to be regulated um and also it could lead to ethical issues with um you know children being able to edit their genes um especially when they're perhaps not fully informed about the the risks of that um and that would perhaps need to be restricted um, so yes, that again leads to, and also with elderly people being perhaps more vulnerable, that could lead to more, you know, ethical issues there as well. Um, yeah, there's a, Sidan, do you want to perhaps do the next comment? Yeah. Someone said similar to how a lot of people believe that antibiotics can treat in illness, any illness, one of the reasons why antibiotic resistance is increasing, people may also believe that gene therapy can treat anything, so it may be overused, and I thought that was really interesting because Considering that, like I said, gene therapy would mean changing a gene, which is a fundamental part of your body, they could, you know, it, it could be misconstrued as a um, something that can fix everything, and that you know, if you can change the slightest part of your body, you can change everything. Um, and I think that's really interesting because, obviously, this is a very highly experimental treatment, and getting the information out there about exactly what it can treat will be quite difficult. And not only that, but because if at one point it is successful and it can treat the most difficult of diseases such as cystic fibrosis, then, you know, there's no wonder people will believe that it can treat anything. It can treat something that has no cure um, up to now. So, yeah, I, complete, I think that's a really, really good point. I feel like the only thing is I don't, with antibiotic resistance, uh, maybe we just can't see it yet, but I feel like with antibiotic resistance, it, it, it increased the strains of um, super bacteria. I don't see the, I see it being, you know, it's possible that it would be overused, but I don't see it having any sort of a uh, rise of some sort of biological organism, which is specifically resistant to it. I'm not entirely sure, obviously, because we can't say that for now. And I'm sure people, um, when antibiotics were created, I'm sure people thought the same thing, but possibly, you know, that could be something to consider. Uh, someone said, plus if children were to have parents making decisions for their child uh, for their child's gene therapy patient autonomy and informed consent would have to be taken into account what if the parents want their child to have it but the child doesn't how would doctors deal with this that's a really interesting question i i mean the way i thought about it is um i think yeah i think i agree with you that the other thing is unlike antibiotic resistance that would have a lot a lot more of a short-term effect on children or anyone than gene therapy would because i don't it doesn't seem feasible to change your genes at a younger age and then be able to completely change it back at an older age with no repercussions. So I think that's a really interesting idea. Uh, Shivas? Yeah, actually, I was, I was thinking about that because it's quite similar um, to, you know, vaccination in some ways, because um, obviously we have um, babies who are vaccinated against certain diseases in this country, um, you know, when, when they are babies, as soon as they're born, really. 
um, and they, they don't necessarily have to make a decision about that. It's just automatically done um, because of the wider impacts that we have um, to society being able to prevent you know, measles and similar diseases. So you know, perhaps if gene therapy were to be you know, implemented into our society, would it be ethical to have a similar approach with that, whereby you know, babies' genes are edited as soon as they're born or even before they're born at the embryonic stage um, without their own consent? Um, but perhaps with their parents' consent, because it would have a better um, impact on the baby, it would stop them from getting a certain disease. So, you know, in terms of vaccination, we've seen that it is something which has been deemed ethical. Um, but, you know, could we use a similar approach for gene therapy? Or would that be, um, would that be ethical, considering the huge risks that gene therapy has um, in comparison to vaccination, for example? Um, actually, just one more point I wanted to add. Yeah. Um, which I thought of relating to one of the earlier comments that were made um, about you know gene therapy only being available to the wealthy. Um, if gene therapy is so expensive and it's such a kind of elite method of, of being able to enhance yourself, then that also means um, a kind of black market could emerge, similar to how we have you know organ donation. There is you know huge demand for organs, and that means that sometimes people do you know obtain organs through, um, you know, um, from, you know, different countries, from people who've given them unsafely. Um, and that obviously has a huge risk. Could we perhaps see a similar thing with gene therapy, where people are getting gene treatments um, from, you know, third parties um, at a much cheaper cost? If there are risks, you know, obviously there, there will be risks to these, to people obtaining them in this way. Um, and that could also lead to ethical issues and indeed a greater class divide or a divide between um, wealthy people who are able to obtain, um, you know, um, the kind of trialed um, treatments and perhaps people who are less wealthy who um, have to resort to um, these unreliable treatments that are offered. And that's, of course, if this is offered by the private sector. Um, so, yeah, we've got a few more comments here. Um, someone has said, um, surely only selecting advantageous characteristics will further reduce the gene pool of organisms, and if there is an environmental change, then it will be harder for species to survive, maybe. Yeah, that's an interesting point, and, you know, it links to evolution, but some people would argue that humans are kind of beyond evolution now. We live in a world where, you know, if there was a great environmental change, we will be able to adapt anyway because of how advanced we are as a species. Um, so, you know, perhaps that wouldn't be such a, a disadvantage, um, but, you know, it's a valid point nonetheless. Um, and it's, it's true that, you know, if, if there is a change, if, you know, a virus or, you know, a certain disease starts to spread um, or something, it might be um, harder for, um, you know, humans as a species to be able to counteract that and to be able to respond to that if we have, you know, deselected genes that we don't think are relevant. Um, or necessary for our survival. Um, we've got another comment here saying, if gene therapy crossed the germline, um, then patient choices would automatically be inherited by offspring. And that might also lead to problems with gene production and fertilization. Partners may need to undergo genetic screening to make sure their child would even be viable for life. Yeah, that's an interesting point, actually. And, um, you know, there, there have been many, um, I've, I've read a couple of articles, I think, about about this kind of thing um, and the issues that it could raise. If we are so heavily editing genes, then of course um, that could lead to, you know, we'd, we'd have to try and predict the effect that would have on meiosis and kind of, um, you know, the genetic um, inheritance and that kind of thing. So we would definitely, that would also be a huge area of research um, if we were to try and proceed with gene therapy safely. Um, and, you know, as, as this last comment says about trying to create a designer race links to eugenics that we've seen that we've learned about before um, and of course that is one of the biggest ethical risks um, that there is of, of um, gene therapy yeah um, I think that was a really good point I think we should move on to the next one um, someone's made the point we'll read this one and then uh, move on to the next uh, next question ultimately it can lead to people wanting to create a designer race and i think shivas you touched on this actually um the thing with the designer race is not only that um but i read this article where it could actually lead to advances in the military where people are trying to you know 
breed children who are specifically best for the military or some children who are, um, you know, specifically as soon as they're born, they got undergo gene therapy. This is all considering gene therapy works perfectly, by the way. Um, you know, considering it works, then they could go and they could change it and they could make sure that this person is perfect for the military, but that completely overrides autonomy um, because that person might never have wanted to go into the military, but we would never know. Uh, okay, so next question. Will the high cost of, G oh, we've already covered this. Uh, could the widespread use of gene therapy make society less accepting of people who are different? So now think about this, um, kind of like plastic surgery. Imagine if plastic surgery or gene therapy was so used so commonly that anyone who didn't use it to change something about themselves were looked down upon. Do you think that that would happen? Or do you think that gene therapy would never be that commonly widespread if it was available? Do you think plastic surgery may never be that widespread if it's uh, you know that available to people? Um, what does everyone think? Do you think it might become fashionable to undergo, you know, plastic surgery or gene therapy? Yeah, okay, so the question is, the question says, um, could, I'm gonna, like, if basis of it is, if gene therapy becomes so available that everyone can access it, it's cheap enough for everyone to be able to, um, for everyone to be able to, you know, pay for it and access gene therapy, do you think it would be bad, or do you think people, who won't undergo gene therapy because they don't want to and they don't want to change things about themselves would be looked down upon. Similar to plastic surgery, you know, if, if plastic surgery becomes cheap enough for everyone to access it, do you think it would be uh, a source of sort of bullying for people who don't undergo it to change things and make themselves look better? Uh, okay, so someone said, people could be peer pressured into having gene therapy, having that sort of toxic environment could lead to depression for those who didn't want it. Yes, that's true. So not only would it be peer pressure, but that can actually have an effect on mental health. And mental health is very much affected by not only what happens uh, to you specifically, but your environment that you're in. Um, and the idea that the entire that society uh, doesn't like something that it can be a big source of peer pressure. The other thing is, you know, if you think about social media, a lot of the medical topics we talk about can be influenced by social media and public opinion is influenced by social media. So imagine if that becomes a trend and everyone knows about it, as someone said, it could become a trend, right? So if that becomes a trend and on social media, then from a young age, people who are using social media might be thinking that they need to undergo social ther uh, gene therapy to um, be understood or to be accepted. Uh, someone said, um, People are more likely to feel pressure to have gene therapy on themselves or their children in order to access fair treatment in society. Yes, again, that's that's exactly correct. That, like I said, you know, people might feel like they need gene therapy um, to be accepted or to be uh, heard in society, and it could become sort of a status symbol. Uh, Shivas? Yeah, no, I absolutely agree, and I think um, all the points that have been raised here are really, really good and really true in, in what we can see today with regards to cosmetic surgery um, and, and similar things like that. Um, so I think there is definitely a possibility of that if gene therapy is, you know, not regulated enough. Um, and of course, it could lead to bullying, it could lead to some people being superior to others and, um, you know, that could lead to depression, other mental illnesses as well. Um, so yes, perhaps many people think that, you know, we shouldn't be trying to um, create a society where we're trying to fix the, the cause of these conditions, especially if they're not so harmful, you know, when we talked about deafness and that kind of thing. Um, but instead, we should be looking towards creating a society where we're, which is adapting to these conditions, which is, um, you know, adapting to people. We should be looking into research into treatments for these conditions um, rather than, you know, um, enhancing people um and you know so that's 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 really the the argument that that's present there um some people have said you can look at someone said you can look at how vaccination is very commonly used with governments help rolling it out making it compulsory in countries to prevent disease um in children especially um 
yet it could pull countries could pull resources to make it compulsory um yeah and that of course would have an impact on autonomy um and consent and that kind of thing um some people argue it shouldn't be used in non-medical reasons similarly to cosmetic surgery um as the money could be used for research other illnesses um definitely so yeah i i, I mean i completely agree with all the points here and i think it's been a very we've had a very good discussion about this um so yeah i don't really have anything more to add yeah okay um and the last question let's just go into the last question then um should people be allowed to use gene therapy to enhance basic human trains oh we've already talked about this as well so i think a lot of these questions are quite interlinked and uh we've really covered all of the points and again with ethics as we mentioned especially if it's interviews or wherever you have to go um it's quite important that you mention the four ethical pillars pillars and relate all your answers to them um today's been a sort of a short a short session but uh before we wrap up uh, i just wanted to talk about um our social media so we've been actually uploading all these sessions onto youtube so you can type as i've showed you you can type in the medical debate and access all our previous sessions we've got interviews with uh oxford university of oxford students imperial college students as well as many other scientific topics and you can see on the top right rules of our instagram where we publish news about you know our latest um uh, our, our latest sessions and uh, fly to our PPT. So please give us a follow on Instagram and take a look on YouTube. Um, you know, watch all of our previous videos. This one will be on there by the end of today as well. Um, but other than that, thank you very much for coming. And if you have any questions, please let us know. Shivas, yeah. anything else? Dan? No, I just that uh, I've just put the link to our YouTube channel in the chat now. So if you'd like to, you know, have a look at that and subscribe, then please do. Um, but um, yes, we don't have a website, someone's just asked, but we do have um, our YouTube channel and our Instagram where we have, you know, all the information about our sessions um, and all of that. But if you, if you don't have Instagram or if you, if you don't want to, um, if, you, if you want to communicate with us, if you want to contact us, please do email us at the gmail at themedicaldebate at gmail.com and we'd be happy to answer any questions you have there. Um, so yeah. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming to this session. We hope to see you again next week.